For the next three weeks, we are going to be changing it up and hearing different people's reconstruction stories. So we'll have three different people joining us who have gone through a big period of deconstruction and then hear how and why they were able to reconstruct their faith in spite of everything they went through. Tonight, joining us is Naomi Wright. She is the founder of Naomi Wright Ministries, which exists for those whose lives have been, presently are, and have the potential to be impacted by an unhealthy religious experience. We just absolutely love what Naomi has been doing in this space, and we just thought it would be great to have her on here and to have her share her story with us. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over uh, to her to share a bit about her experience, and then we'll spend some time talking and taking questions. So please give Naomi a big Dr. Joel welcome in the chat, and Naomi, to you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here, and maybe I don't have to say this, but I feel like I need to. Um, I am traveling right now, and so I'm coming to you from a borrowed office space, which was graciously loaned to me this evening, and I have a coffee shop above me, so it just sounded like people were running, and I look shadowy and kind of creepy, so please bear with me. I apologize for some of those, <laughs> those extra distractions, um, but I really hope that this serves everyone who's here. I'm hoping it gives you some, some things to think about, um, and I hope that well, as much as I hope no one does actually relate to this story, if you do, I hope it provides some, some solidarity that you're not alone um, and that there's, there's a lot of hope ahead for you. So to kick it off, I am going to share a bit of a background about my story. And if you all don't mind, I hope you don't, I'm going to do this in a new way. I want to share it with you by sharing some memories, some specific memories that I have. And I'm going to do it briefly. I'm not going to rabbit trail. Um, and then with each, I'm going to point out a specific issue that I want to highlight for you that was present in my experience. So I'm going to give this a go and I'd love your feedback. Let me know if you like this or not. So my first memory, I was locked in a laundry room um, at bedtime and that was attached off the side of our house. So I was kept outside of the main house. And that was so that I didn't disturb my dad when he was resting. And it was actually, the door was tied shut with a jump rope. So I couldn't get out. And I can remember being so afraid and lonely and not knowing what the shadows on the wall were from outside from the trees and not knowing um, that the creepy sounds were the furnace and things like that. So in that memory, I'd like to highlight an example of neglect. I then remember being eight and I was riding a bicycle down a hill that was loaned to me by a friend and the front wheel of the bicycle actually flew off while I was going down the hill. So really no fault of anyone. Um, but through that, I suffered a really significant head injury as well as other physical injuries. And I ended up being unconscious for 18 hours. Um, through that entire experience, including the healing, I saw I was given absolutely no medical care. So I never saw a doctor. Um, I have this faint memory of being picked up and carried somewhere. I'm assuming that's when I was picked up off the street. That later came back to haunt me in 2015 when I was in another auto accident. Um, and that was considered a re-traumatization of my brain and the recovery from that was much more difficult. Around that same age, around the age of eight, oh, sorry, what I wanna highlight there is the no medical care. Around that same age, a man started buying me really nice gifts and was super nice to me. He was an older gentleman. I would guess he was maybe in his 30s or so. And I remember thinking so highly of him because he was so kind and I wasn't treated very kindly. So I embraced the kindness. I still remember this jacket he got me. It was suede and it had this beautiful floral embroidery on it. And I just felt really special with how he treated me. I found out later on in my life that he was actually trying to stake claim on me as a future wife for when I was of age. So with this, I'd like to highlight women as property. As I got a little older, my dad started coming into the bathroom when I was showering. He would pull the curtain and watch me. At the age of 16, he started kissing me on the mouth. So this is my personal experience with a form of sexual abuse. Throughout my school years, I remember the school bus would circle past our house before dropping my brother and I off at home. My dad traveled, so he wasn't always with us. If we circled by and we saw my dad's car in the driveway, 
I would feel a severe panic. I could still remember that feeling when I talk, talk about it. And I instantly withdrew into myself, wanting to become as small as invisible as possible. I never knew when he would explode. I never knew when he would throw my brother into the wall again or whack our heads together or whack them on the side of our brick house or drag us by our ears or beat us with a belt. So physical abuse. Just the same, every night we had to go into his bedroom and give him a hug and a kiss goodnight and tell him that we loved him, despite our fear of him and how he had treated us throughout that day. I'd like to highlight narcissism. While at school, I so obviously did not fit in. I was in public school, which is a bit unusual for stories like mine. There were blessings and curses in that. But while at school, I didn't fit in. I didn't celebrate any holidays, including birthdays. I wore long skirts, didn't cut my hair because those were boys territory. I didn't wear makeup because that would mean I was like Jezebel. I did not have pierced ears because that would be symbolic of not wanting to hear the word of God. And I certainly did not go to concerts filled with satanic music. This would be some fundamentalism, but some is straight up false theology based on scripture. When my half siblings would visit, I had to introduce them as my cousins in order to keep my family safe and protected because having multiple wives was illegal and my dad had multiple wives. The world didn't understand the truth of God is what I was told. I'd like to highlight polygamy and siege mentality here. I remember wanting to visit a friend, but my dad wasn't in town. And so I had to send him a fax requesting permission to go visit a friend. I'd like to highlight control. At 16, I stayed with my dad for a summer in another state where he had other families. And one night a friend and I had a sleepover. We overslept, stayed up late talking, of course. We overslept and missed the morning Bible study. We were chastised in front of the entire group for our disrespect and accused of being same-sex attracted and in a relationship. Emotional abuse, manipulation, and shame culture. When I was 21, I knelt before my dad's chair and I pleaded for his life. My dad appeared to be dying, but this could not be so because he was the final prophet. He was heralding Jesus's third and final coming and would rock right into the new heavens and the new earth with the rest of us. We were the true Israel. I'd like to highlight false doctrine. My mom was my world. She had not protected me. This is a true statement, but she had offered me the most safety of anyone in my life. And I know she loved me. Her heart broken-minded and she celebrated when I had a win. This time when I saw her fading, I believed she would indeed die. She would go to be with my dad, who was in another country teaching and preaching the final special revelation of God's word. He was not truly dead. And he needed her with him by his side to help. Congruent with our belief, she would not access medical care. So I watched her die. I brushed her hair and I tried to brush her teeth, being careful to go around the sores in her mouth anything to give her a sense of dignity and to show her my love for her in her final days. On a Saturday night, I walked out of her room for a few moments and returned to find her breathless. I would like to highlight unnecessary loss of life, destruction, and devastation. All of this because scripture was used to back all of this highlight spiritual abuse of a pseudo-Christian cult. And that is how I would summarize my experience. Well, thank you. First off, just for sharing um, your story. I know just from um, some of the podcasts I've listened to and videos I've watched that this is a newer experience for you sharing your story with the world. And so um, for, I just wanna say thank you that, and we appreciate you coming here and being willing to, to speak your truth and uh, to acknowledge what you went through. And then not only that, but to use it now to help other people. I think that is just 
um, amazing. So I do have um, a couple questions, but I do want to encourage anyone uh, listening to also submit questions and comments that you might have as we go through. So one thing I want to highlight before I go too far into it, um, and you mentioned it, all of this was done all of, all of these actions, all of this um, abuse and mistreatment was done under the name of Christianity. Is that correct? Absolutely, yes. Scripture was used to back all of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and so coming from this experience, obviously you um, are in a very different place now with your faith. Is that correct also? Yes, and obviously, that's the hard part. Well, there's more hard part, but that was, <laughs> we're ending on a way happier place than that. So I'm pleased, anyone who's listening, this isn't going to end on a downer. So stay with us. <laughs> this goes somewhere really good. <laughs> we have, we have a trajectory. We'll get there. Yes. <laughs> so one of the things we really like to focus on here at Christ Church, or Dot Church, sorry, uh, is the idea of deconstruction. And so I was wondering if you could maybe take us through um, your deconstruction journey, because we, we've talked a lot about what that looks like, but we haven't, I think, related it to someone's personal experience. So maybe start at the beginning. What was kind of that first step you took in your deconstruction? Yeah, and this is, I love this question. Um, it's something I haven't really thought about before. And so... I've needed to, to sit with it for a minute. Um, my first step truly as, as odd as it may sound and I'll explain it a little bit was actually leaving where I lived at the time. So we weren't supposed to move. Um, as big as God, we believe God to be that God could kind of resurrect my father and land him in another country teaching and preaching. Some, somehow, if we left where we lived, if we left the hub, he wouldn't know where we were anymore. <laughs> so we were supposed to leave. And after my mom passed away, I finished up my master's degree. And I knew I needed some space between that location and myself. And it was way less about the group and my beliefs than it was the grief of having lost my mom. And but moving away from the group, like I said, that wasn't something that was permitted, let alone encouraged. And so that was really the first step. And that gave me then space to start to seek God really, truly myself versus, I don't know if there's any PKs out there, but when you just kind of follow along in dad's footsteps or mom's footsteps, whatever that looks like, and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm rolling with it, but I don't really maybe know about all this myself. I haven't made that decision yet. Um, I was very similar to that. And so it gave me space to start to explore. So that'd be my start. Definitely. No, that's great. What, um, what would you say was the hardest part to deconstruct? What was the hardest part to kind of, um, mm -hmm. I don't know, reformat your mind around? Yeah. So as I started to deconstruct, my primary goal was to connect with my parents. So I, you know, I was still a spiritual person and I believed that they were not even if they were physically dead, they weren't spiritually gone. So I was trying to work that through. And so that took me in a, a pretty classical new age direction. Um, and what I mean by that is I started looking at tarot cards. I started getting Reiki. I went into things like that. And my goal was to connect with my parents. I wanted to hear from them because my dad was really my God. I can say he was my prophet, but he was really acting as God for me. And so I wanted that guidance from them to continue forward. Um, so I started going in that direction while simultaneously walking into a church building for the first time. And that was something where I was told God would smite me if I went into an actual church. Those were heathens. Wow. And so that was, a, that was a really bold move on my part, as silly as that may sound. 
Um, so it's kind of exploring. I didn't really know what what Christianity really was, and I didn't yet know that what I thought was Christian, being what I raised in, that that was wrong. So as far as the most difficult idea to reconstruct, intellectually, everything started to unravel fairly easily once I began really studying. Again, on a cognitive level, there are there were things that I was taught that were so blatantly, obviously wrong when I read scripture. Scripture isn't always that easy, you know, to like dig through, but there's some stuff where it's like, okay, where did they get that from? That's obviously incorrect. But what was really difficult for me in deconstruction was the emotional component because this was my family. These are people I loved. So I really have experienced myself and I believe that I can take the heart much more time to recover than the mind sometimes in situations like this. So intellectually, I could know my dad was a false teacher. My dad took advantage of his position for sexual gain and for control. I watched my mom die too young, unnecessarily and tragically, and that's undoable. I may never see either of them again. I don't know. I don't actually know that Jesus will return in my lifetime like I thought I did. I might have to die. <laughs> I grew up believing I wouldn't have to do that. So all of those things I could know with my mind, but emotionally, those are incredibly impactful statements that I just made. So I had to be willing yeah. to let, let the truth be true and deal with the emotional fallout. So as far as, yes, a difficult idea, it wasn't any specific idea. It was more of the emotional journey I had to go on with each one. Definitely. Yeah. It's that head heart connection that mm-hmm. really gets you. Um, we have some awesome questions coming in from the chat. So I'm going to interlace those with the ones I have. Sure. Um, we have a question. How did your siblings handle you leaving? Um. I'm going to answer that in a couple ways just to make sure I'm clear. Um, they handled me leaving the state just fine because my my brother and I, both the same mother, we were the only two in New York State. And so when I left New York State, that didn't really impact them so much. It's a different answer for how they have handled me leaving as in me going public with having been raised in a cult. Um, my, my brother, the same one I just referenced, um, he's very supportive. He has said to never call him for an interview, (laughs) but he's supportive of me, which I appreciate. Um, you know, it's my calling, not his. So, but some of my siblings are still in this. And obviously I am now kind of the ultimate Judas. I have betrayed the group. Um, I am wrong. Um, I'm going to be damned. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm hopeless. So that's been hard. Some have said, you know what? You're my sister. I don't care. I love you anyway. So there's a bit of a mix there. It's wow. been challenging. Yeah. Um, Vince asked, was this group part of a larger organization? Are, are there other churches out there like this or was this a standalone? As far as all of the all of the doctrine, the specifics, it is a standalone. However, my dad did pick up, I would say he's a, he was a splinter group from a gentleman named William Brenham, who died back in 1965 in a car accident. And he had a ministry um, that really focused on healing. Um, I would say he fell into the Pentecostal area, and I don't mean that as a negative. Um, But he was also a false teacher. And so he took that, unfortunately, into a negative realm. And that church is still international. Um, And my dad became a part of that, then branched off of it, and then messed it up to the degree that people wouldn't necessarily think they were related. So it's a splinter, but I would say a kind of an extreme one. For example, the Brandomites don't support polygamy. And that's, that can be a big difference. Definitely. Um, I like this question from Rachel as well. Did anyone in your life, teachers, social workers, principals, other adults, recognize this insane amount of abuse and neglect and try to intervene in some sort of way? It's because you said you went to, you went to public school. Yeah. Uh, I love the heart behind that question. (laughs) 
<laughs> Rachel, I feel like you would have wanted to help me and thank you for that. Um, no, that did not come up. Um, at one point there was an indication of sexual abuse and we had someone, maybe you all have had this, but someone comes into the classroom and they'll, they'll talk about a topic in hopes of uh, people would come forward if there was an issue. And so I had mentioned that and my mom unfortunately worked for the school. She worked right under the superintendent. And so there was extra pressure there to, to maintain because her job could be threatened. So we had to you know, maintain the, the image. And I got in a lot of trouble for that, for bringing it up. Um, and so I just never brought anything up again. So people just thought we had a different form of belief. I mean, we have freedom of religion, which we're so thankful for here in the United States. And situations like this can go under the radar because we can think, oh, they just have a different doctrine, that's fine, which is fine. But if we dig a little deeper and we find out, well, it's actually a cover and there's all this other stuff going on, that's when we really have a problem. And unfortunately, my mom was a lovely individual. Everyone adored her. And so there was no assumption behind the scenes that the children were actually in jeopardy. It was just, okay, they're different. Like a Jehovah's Witness is different or something else that they know of is different. Yeah, for sure. How young were you when you were, you started to be instilled with that idea of like secrecy and that you had, you couldn't share about your home life with other people? It had to be before I can remember. I can't remember not having that. I remember always having this, this feeling of fear and always being on to have to filter things. And I don't think I realized how much I did that until I started to stop a year ago. I'm like, whoa, I used to do that all the time. It was constant and it's so freeing, even though this has been a, a challenging experience in many ways, it's so worth it, but it's also given me a new sense of freedom to walk into a room and be able to really be me and not have to hide and filter all that stuff. I mean, I would never want to get asked, oh, what de denomination were you raised in? Or even simple things about music or culture for my, my, um, my generation. I wasn't allowed to participate in any of that. So I'm like, I'm kind of like an 80 year old and a 36 year old body. I don't really know my culture. I wasn't raised with my culture. Ask me about 1940s musicals and I will like, like answer every question. For you. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. No, um, we have some great stuff coming in. Oh, Rachel did uh, said, said she was, she is a social worker. Hmm. So she definitely would have wanted to help. Um, yeah. Just a lot of people. I feel you, girl. I have my MSW as well. <laughs> no, a lot of people in here just want to say thank you as we're going on for just for just sharing uh, the, the awesomeness. So um, there's another great question that kind of actually weaves into one of mine. Uh, he asks, how could you even read the Bible after this? Uh, seems like the last place you would look for answers. Yes, 100%. That is a very insightful question. And I could not read the Bible after this. Um, the only book I would read was the book of Ruth, because that's what I was named after. And so I was very familiar with that story. It's pretty simple. It's pretty, it's not super challenging. It's just reads kind of like a nice story. I'm not saying there isn't more to it. There is, but it was just like a nice, simple read. It's like what, four chapters or something. And I would go to that when I felt like I should be spending time in the Bible. So it was more of this feeling of, well, I ought to be, I've always been told that, but I'm afraid of it. I don't know what to do with it. And so that was the only thing I would read. Um, and I think part of this, I don't want to go too far um, into maybe something else, but I needed to I needed to know God first. And that came through his grace and my I mean, he knows he knows what we need. He knew that I was not going to find him in the Bible first. It's just that wasn't possible for me. Just like he would know if someone in you know, the middle of nowhere doesn't have access to a Bible. He's not going to hold them accountable for not reading the Gospels. Like he, he reaches us how we can be reached safely. 
Um, and so I found him in other ways. And that's how I started to know, he, how I'm becoming to know him is not what I was told. And then I started to be curious about what the Bible had to say. No, that's great. That leads me into my next question, actually. Um, I was hoping you could talk to us about how you came out of your deconstruction, loving and serving a God who for a majority of your life was a very different God than who you know now. Yeah. So when I moved out to Colorado, I didn't know anyone. I didn't know anyone. I fit what would, I packed into my little Prius what would fit. And I moved out, I couch surfed, I slept in my car, I, <laughs> I did what I, you know, I did things that terrify my husband now. He's like, how are you still alive? I'm like, I don't know, but thank God I am. <laughs> um, and I was so broken during that time. I was so broken. And yet, I mean, I had, I think I moved out when I was 26. I had like all of these years of damage and pain and hurt and confusion that I had never been allowed to actually work through. And so I had to actually sit with that. And I remember at points I sat in a room that I was staying in and I would just stare at the wall literally for hours, just allowing myself to feel the anxiety until it was subside enough from like, okay, I can stand again. Um, I had some very, poor coping mechanisms at that time. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying that in a way where I'm judging myself or I would judge anyone else. I said that I say that they're poor because they actually, they hurt me more. Um, such as I was bulimic, too much drinking, things like that, where I'm like, it didn't, it didn't actually serve me in the way that something else could have. So that's the state I was in. And yet I want to tell you that because I want to contrast this other feeling that I had I'm feeling that level of anxiety and pain and brokenness and just, it was awful. And yet I would feel this peace simultaneously. And it was this feeling of almost floating. I felt so light and that's in contrast, you know, how lost and devastated I was. And I knew that that was God encouraging me. I knew that he was with me and I, I felt inside of myself. I felt that if I didn't give up, then my state at that time was not going to be permanent. But I had to allow myself to feel the pain, to grieve my losses, and take just the very next step forward every time that I could. And I did get confused sometimes on what was God and what wasn't, but I genuinely wanted to know more of his kindness. I felt his kindness and I felt this beauty that I knew existed from looking at the mountains and looking at the sun setting through the trees and in his faithfulness. Again, he redirected me back to him every time I, I became confused. So if I were to summarize that experience of coming to know who God truly is, I, I would summarize by saying I had three responsibilities for myself. And one was to stop distracting myself and allow myself to genuinely begin healing because distraction was my favorite coping mechanism. I was always busy. <laughs> um, two, to seek the truth of who he is, which for me personally did end up including a seminary education. It's not required for me, it worked well for me. I learned well in a classroom, so that was helpful. And three, to remain humble and open-handed with what I had previously believed while still persevering. So being willing again to admit that something was wrong or bad and then dealing dealing with the consequences of that acknowledgement. I, I just, I couldn't give up. Even though I had to admit some very painful things about my life and my family, I needed to, to persevere and keep going. Definitely. What, um, what encouragement would you give to someone who might not have the same experience um, that you had, but who is, is struggling with church hurt and with bad past experiences with false doctrine and things like that. How would you encourage them um, moving forward? Yeah, absolutely. And I wanna state for anyone who's listening, um, I've been told, and I get it, my story can be more on the like extreme side. I don't really care. <laughs> I don't care if I'm considered extreme. There's a spectrum to this and wherever you fall on it, ultimately what it means is that you have been treated 
unjustly, unfairly, you have been harmed and that is unacceptable. And though our circumstances that have put us in that position could be very different, ultimately, I believe that our emotional experience is a place that we can overlap and it's there where we can come alongside one another and we can help each other to heal. And yes, I just saw that pop up myself. Trauma is trauma and pain is pain. And yes, absolutely, I would agree. I agree with that. Um, I think it can be tempting to blame God for things in this life. It's, um, I think it can seem like it's his fault when people do bad things. I'd also like to offer to everyone that it can sometimes be easier to blame God. And for my story and my experience, that definitely would have been the case. It would have been easier than the deconstruction I actually had to do and then the reconstruction on the other side of it. God is intangible to us right now, unlike when Jesus walked the earth for the first time. And so it can be easier to blame him than to blame the person who is actually at fault. But as hard as that may be to admit that truth to ourselves, the freedom potential is so worth it. And so I would encourage people to, again, take the very next step and try to be willing. Definitely. Um, someone submitted this question, and I think it's uh, a great tool to arm ourselves with. So it says, most of us may never find ourselves in a cult like you experienced, but what should we watch for in our congregations that are signs of control or cult-like practices? Hmm. I love that question so much that I spent weeks doing a bunch of research and also using our um, ministries podcast interviews as well. Um, and created a whole talk on red flags of unhealthy leadership with backing for it. Um, I wouldn't be able to give that well right now because it's probably like a 35 to minute, 35 minute talk on its own. However, um, it is going to be airing on our YouTube channel. If, if you don't mind, if I share this, it's going to be airing on our YouTube channel on July 7th. And we're going to have a live Q&A with it. If you want to be a part of it, I'd love to have all of you. That's, that's such a big part of my heartbeat for this work that we're doing is to equip people who have not had an experience yet so that they don't, they can recognize it as well as people who have been victimized. I want them to get the information so they're not re-victimized because oftentimes people are hopping from one thing to the other and they're getting so hurt and it just, it just wrecks me. Um, so again, this is a huge passion of mine. And so I'm like, I'm not going to launch into it, but I want to. <laughs> so, so please, yeah, join us for that. And if you can't make it live on July 7th, you'd miss the live Q&A part, which is fine, but it's going to live on YouTube. So you can always go back and watch the replay. Definitely. With that, um, what other resources, like, so from, uh, from the Naomi Rights Ministry side, what other resources do you guys provide? And and yeah thank you so much for asking so really the reason we we founded is because there isn't a whole lot out there um especially in the area of prevention you might find a bit more for healing it's still not great um depending on the state you're in you might not find anything and so that's something we're working on on remedying as well um but some other things that we offer right now are the full first annual conference series that we're doing. So it's a presentation series. So we've done two of the seven so far. We have some really cool ones coming up, including Can I Trust God is this Thursday um, when church and community become triggers. I love that one. Church and community were triggers for me. So that, that I picked that title. <laughs> so if anyone resonates with that, where they like they hear church, they hear community, and they're like, I'm out this might be a really good conversation for you to tune in for. Um, so that's going on right now. We're gonna be launching our first online course in the fall to get people some of that unhealthy red flags information. Mm -hmm. um, we have our podcast, which share stories, but I also supplement the stories with deep dive episodes so that we can go more into what was wrong, why was it wrong and what can we look for as we move forward. Um, and lastly, I'd love to highlight that we do have a mentoring program and that language can be a little tricky. I had some legal stuff where I kind of had to use that word because of me being a social worker. So I sort of got stuck with it. So I hope that that isn't triggering for anyone. Um, but it's an opportunity to just have conversations of, 
I just need someone who might get this in a different way as I'm trying to figure out what are my next steps or I have a friend who's in something or a daughter in something and I'm not sure what to do and I would love to just talk about that with somebody again who gets it and that's all pay it forward if 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 you're able to support something great and if you're not i i don't care like i want you there so none of this has a, a price tag attached no that's awesome if someone anthony or someone could throw um the website in the chat that would be great because i think that is an awesome resource for people uh to definitely check out um i'm gonna have us wrap up with this one last question that i i love what advice would you give in helping to support a survivor of abuse? How do we show love without making them feel like they are being treated like fragile glass? What are some things not to say? Hmm. One, I think you're already on to this one, whomever asked the question, and that is to address it not to ignore it because that can make the person feel like it's not an acceptable topic. Like it's taboo, like maybe you're not interested or they're wearing on you. Maybe they brought it up too much. So we always want to acknowledge it, even if we're uncomfortable. We can even say, I'm not sure what to say, but I want you to know that I'm thinking about this and I'm, I'm hurting on your behalf and this matters to me. So I don't, I don't know what you need, but I, I, want, I want to be here. I want to be available. My next suggestion would be that oftentimes someone who is a trauma survivor, they have a hard time themselves pinpointing what they need. That can be tough because they're in it. And it's like, I don't even know what I need right now. I'm so overwhelmed by what, what I'm working through. I really encourage people in that um, area to do something that would be a default. Um, having a meal delivered is always great. You know, um, if you know that person more intimately, and you know what is um, comforting for them. If you're like, oh my goodness, I know that this friend loves candles and they love bass. Well, send them a, a care package, you know, or drop it off at the door, ring their bell and walk away. Like do things like that, that are just thoughtful. And that, that means the world to someone who has suffered, um, especially by the hands of someone else, being shown these small acts of kindness, they are not small. I mean, I have people do the smallest things to me in the mind of some even today. And I'm so t deeply touched by the thoughtfulness that was behind it. And so key into that, like what would be thoughtful for this person? How do I let them know that I'm around? Um, and if, if praying for them is comfortable and letting them know that, I would certainly let them know. Um, and we always wanna make sure, I'm gonna throw this out there because it's a pet peeve of mine. We always wanna make sure we actually do it. <laughs> We don't want it to be some Christianese thing of like, oh, yeah, I'm going to pray for you. And then you like go have dinner. So I'm not saying I'm never guilty of that, but be intentional um, and let them know that, that you're there with them. I, I apologize. I'm not sure if that fully answered the question, but that would be kind of my first thing. Oh, if I can add one more. There are these platitudes that yeah. are just never helpful. Um, I had so many people, even through grief, saying, oh, I know how you feel. Well, they had no idea all this was going on. So they certainly did not know how I felt. <laughs> they didn't know that I was dealing with my whole worldview just crashed down because people who are immortal just died. Um, so that's an extreme example to point out that we never, we don't want to go there. Um, we, may, we may relate in ways and we can say, I, I relate in some ways, but your experience is your experience and your trauma is your experience. And so I want to walk alongside you in that but it's not okay. What you experienced will never be okay. You could be okay in the future maybe, and I wanna help you get there, but this isn't okay. And so let's try to avoid things like that. I think that was part of the question too. Like, what should we not do? Let's not do platitudes and let's not ignore what's happening. No, that's awesome. Naomi, thank you so much. I, I think people are gonna just come away from this um, with so much just knowledge and, and a desire to learn more. And so thank you again for being willing to share your story with us and, and to talk through this. Um, you meant, so we, we've talked about the website. What are some other ways that uh, we can contact you or follow you, um, social media, anything like that? Yeah, so we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, um, we're on YouTube, like I said, we're on Twitter, though I'm gonna admit that one doesn't get quite as much love as the rest. Um, sure. 
Yeah, and on the website, we try to keep that updated with things. We send blogs like a couple of times a month, which are meant to encourage and educate. So subscribe on there. Um, if you go to the website, it'll kind of pop up after a second or two. So subscribe, subscribe on YouTube. And yeah, again, I'm hoping that this information really helps people as well as I'm checking out some new options because I find Instagram and Facebook isolating. I don't know about any of you, but I'm like, there's all, there's all these people that are like looking at stuff, but I, I would love to actually connect. So I'm looking at maybe starting, uh, we're looking at maybe starting a Telegram account where people can like support one another or something like that. So stay tuned if you want, like subscribe and follow along. So I'm hoping to do that, maybe even a once a month live thing where people get to join. So yeah, feel free to even submit, hey, I resonated with your story and I would like ways to connect. You know, it would be helpful if I hear kind of what the need is. And the final comment I would like to make is I, I have a great, like life. I mean, I am not perfectly healthy. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> I don't think anyone's perfectly healthy though. And so I just want to say, um, I'm in, I'm in a good place. I have a, I have a family that I love. I've got great friends. I get to talk with people like you. And that is the incredible love of the God that we know. And so I just want to glorify him in that I shouldn't be here. <laughs> I shouldn't be here pretty much alive based on where I was at at some point and beyond that I should not be where I am internally and externally so yeah thank you so much for letting me share that I just want to give a praise and a thank you and end on that note definitely no thank you so much um yes please continue to uh say thanks to Naomi in the chat uh, as we head out and check out all of the uh wonderful ways to connect with her website YouTube um and I'm definitely going to be checking out the live on July 7th, because yeah. that sounds awesome. Uh, so yes, I'm going to turn it over now to Heather, and she is going to close us out in prayer.